Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm here with Riley, also known as LALA21 on 7 Sage. Uh, Riley just recently got a promotion to Sage for having scored a 177 on the September 2017 LSAT. Uh, congratulations, Riley. Um, so to get started, uh, Riley, can I just have you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, where are you physically? Um, what your plans are for uh, between now and next fall when you go to a great law school, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for hosting this, JY. I'm honored and, and humbled to even be asked to do something like this. Yeah, so I'm Riley. I am from Colorado. I was born in Colorado and I uh, still live here in Denver. And um, I graduated from college in 2014. So I've been out of school for a couple of years. And yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be um, pretty involved in speech and debate um, in high school as well as in college. And so I think uh, that's sort of given me a strong background in uh, argumentation and just sort of critically thinking about things that might be somewhat related to the LSAT. Riley, what did you study in college? Um, I was actually in a weird major called Science, Technology, and Society, which is this interdisciplinary major, um, which kind of focused on entrepreneurship and management and how that sort of intersected with technology policy. So bit of an unusual one. Hmm. Um, is that like a feeder program for all the startups around the area? Uh, not, not really. No, I don't know. It, it was definitely a, a growing population or a growing major. I mean, but uh, no, I think those, those kids did CS for sure. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Did, what, how, how does that, I mean, I guess on first blush, it just doesn't sound uh, like it's related to the law. Um, did you have a change of mind later or was that, or did you go into college thinking like, I'm going to do this in preparation for law school? You know, I actually went through college thinking I wasn't even going to do grad school period at all, um, which now in my somewhat more wise year of 25 years of age, I, I see as a mistake. But in any case, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I kind of went into school being interested in business and entrepreneurship. And um, I still think that's really a valuable thing. But I guess really when I started getting interested in law school about a year and a half ish ago, um, it was sort of an evolution of thinking about what I wanted to do in, in life. And I had always been really interested in policy and um, public service. Uh, my family has kind of a long history of public service. And so um, I started thinking about like kind of where my skills could be best put to use and having a really long history of, of doing written and oral argumentation and speech and debate and um, a lot of research and writing in my work experience as well as my school experience, I kind of began to see how being a lawyer could sort of be the way I can maximize applying my, my sort of experience and talent in, in that realm to sort of make, make that impact that I'm hoping to see in the future with public interest law or something like that. Right. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about your family's, uh, your family's uh, history with public service? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, my, actually on both sides of my family, my grandparents were pretty involved in various community organizations, um, especially education and affordable housing. And then my dad actually is, um, has devoted his whole career to basically um, government and nonprofit work. So I think I've really been able to see the strengths and weaknesses of, of government and um, public service and uh, how it ultimately does a lot of really great work. It, are, are you also looking more to the public sector, either government service or nonprofit work for uh, after law school? I think that would be um, ideal for sure. I mean, I know that a lot of those jobs are um, really hard to get. And um, so it'll be a challenge. But yeah, I, I think I don't want to commit myself to anything in particular yet. But I think definitely, right. um, you know, something in the public's, public realm would be kind of my ideal outcome. Right. Cool. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here are wondering, I'm very curious to, to 
uh, find out how you got your 177. Uh, so um, how about speech and debate? Like what, what, what specifically about that do you think helped out with the LSAT? And is that something you'd recommend for um, seven stagers who are currently studying? Oh, man. Um, I guess if you're still in, if you're in college, yeah, go for it. Why not? Um, it can definitely be a good thing. I think the way it really helped me was in just the massive amount of reading you have to do with a critical mindset. I mean, when you're approaching a debate topic, you're basically having to evaluate the strength of evidence and arguments at all times, whether or not it's in preparation for a debate or actually during the debate. And I think for the LSAT, especially logical reasoning and, and definitely still reading comprehension, I mean, you're basically trying to be critical of every uh, every argument that's presented. I mean, I actually had like, I tried to develop a short two or three word mantra before each section of the LSAT to kind of like just quickly focus my mindset in on like task for the for the section and for LR, one of them was like, be critical. You know, I think for a lot of the different types of questions on LR, it really helps to like have that critical mindset. And I think that's probably something that debate helped with. Mm. We already have a question from Snorlax who says, have you ever participated in WUDC? I have not. That's like the world debate championships. So actually I, um, predominantly did high school speech and debate and um, then sort of branched out with working in in that realm in college where I was um, doing work stuff as far as like creating debate materials and stuff. So I really didn't participate that much in the collegiate level of debate. Mm, I see. Let's see, just to sum up, you said uh, massive, massive amounts of reading with a critical mindset. That's the overlapping skill for, for the LSAT. Yeah. Did you, how much time did you spend studying for the test? Um, a ridiculous amount. And <laughs> I realized that everyone can't always do that. You know, I really, really admire the people who are working a job and have family commitments and everything like that and still end up squeezing um, the LSAT in. So that's amazing. But I was really privileged and lucky enough to have a somewhat flexible schedule. Right. And... I really probably did devote, well, I, I started Seven Sage um, in February of 2017. So I guess that was about seven to seven and a half months mm -hmm. of studying. And during that time, I was probably doing like 30 to 40 hours a week in the beginning. And then as time progressed, it probably tapered down to like 15 to 25. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that yeah, I just think one major point, and you wrote this in like a blog article on Seven Sage, is that studying for the LSAT takes way longer than people think. And oh, right. I kind of agree. Like, I think you wrote like people should think about it as a year long process. And I think that that's probably a really great point because just the way like you build knowledge requires time like yeah. repeating those processes over building those neural connections and everything like it's almost more advantageous to you know just throwing out numbers but like study for 10 hours a week over six weeks than study 60 hours in one week right like right. you kind of need that time to circle back and rebuild all those all those connections yeah that's a, that's a really nice um that's a really good way to kind of just crystallize that distinction Right, like 10 hours a week over six weeks is so obviously better than 60 hours a week. Because basically you're just, the latter is just a form of cramming. Right? You can't, you can't really cram for this. So about, about like seven, seven months, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you heard the AMA with Josh, but seven months is, uh, <laughs> is not that much time <laughs> on the... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> on the spectrum of like how much time people can spend studying for this, um, you you hold the you hold the record for the highest score uh, a sage has ever gotten at a one seventy seven. I think Josh maybe holds the record for the longest amount of time a sage has ever studied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at over uh, at over two years. Um, okay, so 
people are asking what what your diagnostic was. Did you do a diagnostic? I did a diagnostic, and um, I got a 160 on that. So I definitely started out in um, in a really good place. Mm -hmm. What was the breakdown for the 160? Uh, I think I got minus five on every section, but LG where I went minus ten. Five on every section with LG. Okay, so yeah, that's that's pretty uh, typical, I think, for uh, high scorers where L LG is like your worst section starting off, right? Because it just looks so alien. Yeah, quite honestly, that was probably lucky on LR, like only getting minus five. I think I could have just as easily gotten way more wrong. Right, right. So that's what a lot of the uh, prepping is is for. It's to uh, minimize that volatility. Right. Yeah. Um, and you only took the LSAT once, right? Yep. Yeah, that's great. We have uh, someone asking, I guess the question is like, did yeah. you focus yeah, exclusively on one section? And then once you master that section, move on to another section? Um, no, I... I definitely did all three, and I really, really strongly believe in in not focusing in on only one section at a time. Um, I'm no scientist, but it seems like there's pretty strong evidence about the process of learning that you want to have diversity in the tasks that you're learning. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading an article about this guy who just decided he'd never played golf before, and he decided he would try to become a professional golfer, and uh, that was sort of an interesting case study uh, about like okay how do you learn processes and he ended up doing it by like type so he started out with putting and then he works to his short game and like chipping and blah 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 but the takeaway of that article is like actually there's a lot of neurological research about it's much better to sort of have this diversity and overlapping and i really agree with that mm -hmm. so i tried to make sure that i was hitting different types of things throughout my prep um a typical day for me, I would usually just start out with LG, just because I knew I could hammer that out while I was doing foolproofing. Um, so I spend a good chunk of that time on LG, and then I'd go into, you know, particular question types or particular um, strategies on LR and work on that for a while, and then I might, from there, go on to do a reading passage or two or something like that. So, mm. um, I mean, you got. I think you could. Anyone should and could go look up, you know, like research on learning how to learn and stuff like that. But I, I'm, I feel decently confident in saying you shouldn't, you know, go do like only one type of LR question or only LG for like an entire month and then right. come back. Right. Do, do you, do you uh, recall why that was like, why that, uh, jump, that diversity helps with learning? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure I really remember the mechanics of it. Um, yeah. But the takeaway was just yeah. make sure you get a diversity. Yeah. Right. Cool. Let's see. Amanda, are you here? All right. Well, I'll, I'll ask the question. Uh, Amanda said, uh, I'd love to hear more about the mantras before each section. How did that come to be a part of your preparation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it started probably around the middle of my PTing phase. Basically, I started to have a like my scores dipped a little and I just felt like I was getting a little bit complacent almost like um, I had been scoring really well around the middle of my prep and I maybe slacked off a little bit and saw some scores dip and I started thinking that was it was basically because I had thought that I'd internalized a lot more than I really had mm. and so I had thought that I could sort of lean on my subconscious more than I was able to and so I just sort of felt like, okay, if I can sort of say these mantras, number one, it'll help me to get in the right, right mindset. And number two, just the act of like doing something intentional before the section will remind me to not be complacent, to like really attack this section. Mm -hmm. um, so my mantras, and they changed through the prep, like, and maybe this is something I'll talk about after this, but I really think that like where you're at in prep, totally changes how you approach the test. But anyway, going back to this, so they changed throughout, but I guess the mantras that I remember for LR, it was critical aggression and speed. And again, you know, scoring in the 170s and, and having, that's where I was at at the time, I needed to stay critical because, you know, I was just not 
especially on like flaw, strength and weaken, sufficient assumption, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being critical enough. I was kind of just like, oh yeah, I'll read the stimulus and like, it'll pop out to me. But then during that phase of my prep, it really wasn't. It was kind of just like, oh man, all right, well, I guess I'll read the answer choices. And that wasn't good. So I started mm -hmm. really pushing myself to get back into a critical mindset, really trying to find the flaw in the argument before going to the answers. And then aggression and speed, I think, just kind of comes from in that last f uh, phase of preparation. Once you're scoring highly, it really benefits you to finish a section early with time to go back for a second pass. Hmm. And so, yeah, I was just trying to really motivate and remind myself to push the pace um, because I think that was ultimately critical to bring those last few LR points onto the board. Yeah, and then for RC, I guess my two little sayings were like read with empathy and the answer is in the passage, don't compare answers. And so basically on the empathy thing, it's like I was really, I, thought, I found it really helpful to try to read the passage in a way where I was trying to figure out like, okay, why is the author writing this piece and what are they trying to really get across? Um, I thought that sort of helped me to sort of develop an mm -hmm. intuitive sense of like the underlying purpose of the passage. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped with some of those overview questions. And then the other sort of point about the answers in the passage, don't compare the answers is basically in the beginning of my prep, I usually was like down to, you know, two or sometimes even three answers on RC and I'd start comparing them to one another. Right. And saying which one is more right or more wrong. And, and ultimately you have to be, really objective and, and realize that all answers except for one are 100% wrong. Yeah. And so I sort of tried to really remind myself, hey, if you're going to go looking for an answer, it's in the passage. It's right. not by comparing the two together. Yeah. And that really helped on RC. Yeah, especially the vast majority of questions on the RC section are like the inference types, right? Or the what was right. stated type or the inference or make an inference type as opposed to like the other way around, like the weakened strengthening. And I like what you said about the empathy, but it definitely helps to it helps to preempt um, for the uh, purpose kind of questions. It also I think it helps to preempt the um, attitude questions, like the author's attitude, and even the main point questions. Really, because mm -hmm. a lot of the main point sometimes wrong answers on main points will be factually correct. Yeah, but they just don't get the emphasis right. And so if you're thinking about okay, well, yeah, that that was in the passage, but why did they really write this? passage yeah. that steers you to the better answer or That's the right. one correct answer. That's right. You, LR, you said the mantra was critical aggression speed. RC was empathy, answers in the passage, and don't compare answers. Now, were those mantras like sort of end stage mantras, like towards the end of your studying? And you said you mentioned, I think you alluded yeah. to some, some evolution in that process. Right. Yeah. And I think it just totally depends on where you are in your prep. So I come from a an endurance sports background. And uh, so I did a lot of sports in college. And basically, like when we were preparing for the season, the preparation we did, you know, during it was a summer ish sport. And so the preparation that we did in the winter and in the spring was entirely different than the preparation we did in the summer. And I think it's sort of similar as to where you are at on your LSAT journey, so to speak. Like you've got to start out not caring at all about timing and not caring at all about mm -hmm. execution. Like you're entirely focused on the fundamentals of logic and argument structure and identifying things. And then as you progress, you might become more task oriented to question types on LR or types of RC passages or something like that. And then from there you start adding on the, you know, the cherry on top of executing a particular strategy. So, I mean, your mantra earlier on in your prep might actually be something more like don't rush because, you know, maybe the nerves get to you enough that you'd rather focus on accuracy in the beginning or yeah something like that. Or you might have, you might have a particular question weakness, like an LR question type that's really weak and you have something to remind you about how to address that question type. Initially, you're saying focus on just your core competencies, like you got to understand how causation logic works, right? You got to understand how conditional logic works, how they're different, like basic grammar yeah, analysis. It, it actually just, so I don't forget it because this is reminding of it. Honestly, my biggest takeaway 
that I would want to drill home to people is that timed practice, in my opinion, is way too overemphasized in like the average student's mind. Hmm. I think, and, and to be fair, timing is super important on the LSAT and that's an in game thing. And like, yeah, 35 minutes is scary, but I see students in the core curriculum of seven stage all the time asking like, should I be timing this? How fast should I be doing these questions? Am I doing them fast enough? And they're just starting out in their studies. Right. And so I actually pretty much never did time practice. The much more important thing to do is to set up a system and a process of attacking the questions in the optimal way, and then practice that over and over and over. And as you gain mastery, your time will automatically take care of itself. Right. That's hard for people to see or believe, <laughs> I think. Um, but okay, so let me let me see if uh, I got I got this right. You're saying you, you did very little time practice, at least in the beginning. I mean, you weren't taking like PTs under full timed conditions, you just were doing problem sets, like taking as much time as you need, just making sure you understand the, um, yep. the, the logic of the, the question, right, the argument. Um, and once you could do that, uh, like time, your speed just picked up naturally as a function of competence, as, as a function of increased competence. Um, how? Like, right. why, and, why, why would that happen? Yeah. Why, why would like becoming more competent help you be faster? I mean, I think it's just a, once you start achieving more competence and mastery, you're able, you're just naturally able to more quickly identify, um, you know, argument parts, argument structure. Right. Once you've repeated um, a process, you know exactly your task. You know, at first, sufficient assumption and necessary assumption questions seem incredibly foreign to, to right. me and everyone else. Right. You're just not used to doing something like that. Yeah, like logic but, games, right? Yeah, and, and like logic games, exactly. Yeah. I just think like, and it kind of depends on where you're at. Actually, there was someone on the forums today talking about this, but basically I think that if you schedule it out enough that you've, you're putting in enough practice tests, that's going to be generally enough timed constraints on your own. So right. I, and I think someone asked this at one point, but I ended up doing over 35 practice tests. And each one of those I did fully proctored using the seven stage app with a timer. Right. So, so just, just to be clear. That was all of the time. Yeah, that was timed. That was yeah. 100% timed to. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's just when you were, before you got to that point of taking lots of PTs, mostly you were focused on doing not timed practice. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then all other drilling all other drilling that I did even during the PT phase was still untimed. Yeah. Yeah. So the only timed work I did basically was the actual proctored practice tests. Yeah. Thir 35 um, of those. Which is a lot. Yes. Yeah. That is a lot. Yeah. I mean, starting from, if you started from 36, that's up to sub PT 70, right? In the seventies. Yeah. I'm guessing, I'm guessing you still had some fresh PT saved in case you were going to take it in December or something. Yeah, I um, started out with 36. And then right around 50 ish, I realized that I just wouldn't have time to do all of them anyway. So mm. I jumped ahead and pretty much skipped most of the 50s. Um, mm. Yeah, and then started back up in the 60s. Yeah. And what was your what was your improvement in your score? Like, did you ever was it just like straight going upwards? Did you ever um, experience a plateau or did your score ever dip below your initial diagnostic of 160? No, it didn't. Um, after I did the core curriculum, the first test I took after the core curriculum, I jumped up to a 168. It, I generally r started rising, but there is variation and to be honest there was variation in my scores throughout the process um i don't know if that's a function of on the upper end it's just really hard to consistently score at the tippy top but um i think it's natural to have variation throughout but yeah it was definitely a battle and i think too there were certain points throughout my prep um where i struggled with with certain things or others like for example um you know, I really tried hard on 
logic games. Um, actually, just to back up and talk about that, I mean, I did so many logic games. I did, I think at the end of the day, I did well over 700 attempts at logic games. Um, Wait, I, 700. so that's a lot. <laughs> 700 <laughs> logic, there's four games per section. So over yeah. 10 prep tests, that's 40 games. Over 100 prep tests, that's only 400 games. So you're saying you definitely did like the same game multiple times. Yeah, I did every um, logic game from 1 through 35 at least five times. Okay. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and then I did, I mean, I did 35 prep tests in each of those. It's the time to take the BR, and then I did most of those at least one other time. Right. Just sometimes to more. Proof it. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, to anyone out there, we always get questions on the seven stage forum like, does foolproofing work? Yes, it really does. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a reason it's called the foolproof <laughs> method. Uh, you just, yeah. you really just got to like grind out yeah. the volume. In any yeah. case, I bring that up because like even I had s slumps. I mean, I had a point where I just felt truly like I was on top of the, uh, the LG world. I remember taking prep test 57, which has two notorious games in it and just destroying, it, like absolutely dominating it. And then I, I went on vacation for like two weeks and then suddenly started missing like four to five questions on LG several times in a row. Oh, no. And so, yeah, I think like no matter what, everyone's going to have their slumps. Yeah. You got to get back to the grind and like keep at it. Yeah. Um, on, on your point about the variation in the test scores earlier, um, it's, I think it, it is to some extent unavoidable, um, especially when you are already in the high 160s, 170s, you have this, your margin of error is just so tiny, right? So that the, uh, just, just an extra few questions, right or wrong, could uh, translate into a big scaled score jump or or decrease um so yeah. that that factor i think i just i always call it just luck um you, you can do everything you you're supposed to do to prepare but at the end of the day there is some element of luck that you you can't really control and i think especially earlier in your prep you just shouldn't be worried about it what you should be focused on yeah you should be focused on this throughout but especially early on is like your br your blind review is absolutely the more important thing than the time test. Yeah. And those scores should be generally more consistent. When you have the time to sit down and, and work through all the problems and do your due diligence and put your effort into the blind review, there's probably not so much variance. I mean, I'm looking at my analytics right now, and especially early on in my prep, I had like eight to nine point swings between timed tests in the beginning. And I think that was basically like, yeah, I just wasn't, I wasn't really practiced and experienced with doing a whole timed test in a row. But my BR scores were all basically the same. Right. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's important. Yeah, that's really important. You got to get your BR scores to be consistent. I mean, that because the BR score is basically a way to take one of the, uh, one of the uh, factors, one of the components that affect your time score out of out of the equation and that component is time, right? So the BR score is just sort of a clean look at your understanding of the material, right? Not under stress, not under time, right. just, yeah. Um, so that's a good way to figure out like, am I getting things wrong because of time or am I getting things wrong because of a lack of understanding, right? So if your BR exactly. score isn't at a 180, um, then there are clearly gaps in your understanding. Um, and that goes back to like my whole idea about don't focus on time work. Yeah. It's like, I think in the beginning of people's prep, your, your diet, your, your time score in the beginning of your PT phase, it is what it is. It doesn't really matter that much. Like you should be way more focused on your BR score. That's the thing you should or shouldn't be proud of. That's right. Um, That's right. Really try to push that up as high as you possibly can. Yeah. Right. So I think we're getting a lot of uh, reactions to, um, you know, your uh, your point of not focusing on timed uh, timed sections. Uh, did you ever like so on that point? The 
LG LG section was your uh, weakest section throughout most of your prep. Um, even for LG, did you not try to like do timed section drills, or um, or did you make an exception for LG? Yeah, I would say that's the one exception was LG. But even then, I was trying to be really cognizant of not rushing. Mm-hmm. So. It was never like, oh, the target time on seven stage is five minutes. So I'll set my timer at five minutes and see if I can get it done. In that time, it was more just like, I'm going to set a stopwatch or a clock that counts up. And I'm going to make sure I do all of my processes, do all my inferences and my setup and answer the questions. And then whenever that's done, I'll click stop and keep track of it. Mm. Um, And I think that mostly just served as a confidence boost over the months to be like, yep, this is definitely working. Like I'm clearly seeing the times drop, you know, like when I started out, I I mean, I have the log, I I definitely set up a log where I recorded the um, trying to maybe even pull it up here. I recorded the, the game that it was the date I was doing it on um, how long it took. And then kind of just a one to 10 rating about how confident I felt. Right. And, um, I mean, starting out, yeah, there were there were plenty of games where uh, I pretty much maxed out at like 25 minutes to do a single game or, you know, 15 plus minutes. <laughs> and uh, then by by the end, I was consistently doing entire sections in around about 15 minutes. Um, so Did, these were those were sections that I already done four or five times. Oh, I see. OK, but, OK. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not, <laughs> although, yeah, I mean, at the end, very indication that I really did get a, a totally fresh section done in 25 minutes, maybe. But yeah, um, that's yeah. great. I think for LG, for sure, repetition and foolproof method, doing the same game over and over. Right. Way um, to go. Okay. So you participated uh, when you were studying, you participated in some like blind review calls, right? That we had uh, the students organize on the forums. Yeah. I did the uh, September study group that we had. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what was that like? How, how did that get started? Like what, what is, what was participating in that call? Like uh, in those calls? Um, yeah. Just, just really anything. So I, th- I think a lot yeah. of people here just have, don't know about, the study groups or if they do have never participated in them. Yeah. Um, actually just to kind of back up and address the larger point of like the seven sage community and participating in it, I'm sort of a quiet social media and internet presence. I don't really like commenting and using things, but the seven sage community was just like so clearly welcoming and friendly and nice. (laughs) <laughs> that I really don't think I could have done this without them. Like, I think I would have scored fine, but there was something about getting involved in this community that like really gives everyone a lot of motivation. Like you just know that so many other people are going through the same struggles as you. Right. You've got people to ask questions and help with. So I think like the act of participating that in, in this community alone was like a unique motivator that really stood out. And that started with me, basically just commenting a ton on the core curriculum um, on all the different videos and morphing from there. Um, And I thought that was so incredibly helpful because at the end of the day, there's nothing more revealing about your own knowledge than trying to explain something to someone else because you have to confront all the assumptions that you're making. Um, So so I really encourage everyone. and, And this is something that, you know, Josh would say, and so would David, from his, his username's accounts playable, but like, yeah, just get out there and, and comment on everything you can and uh, it'll help you and it'll help everyone else. Yeah. But for the, the calls, um, yeah, it sounds, it basically seems like pretty much every test, like a little group gets together and um, we had a large, a pretty large group. Um, we basically just met once a week. We predetermined a schedule. And again, I think that was just so helpful because I think otherwise you would just sort of feel alone. Like you do this test, you were blind reviewed on your own. And then I don't know where you go from there. It's just so much, it's so much more helpful to have unique, uh, sorry, it's so much more helpful to have varying perspectives. And also it's just kind of fun. Like 
<laughs> especially when you're blind reviewing the calls and you genuinely don't know the answer. Right. And two people are both advocating for, for different answers. That can be like really rewarding and entertaining to figure out, okay, what's the actual answer here and how do we get there and that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that process and I would encourage people to join those. There's definitely one going on for December. Yeah. So how, like, uh, I, I guess just some um, uh, nitty gritty questions, like how many people were, would participate in, in the calls? Man, we had a ton of people in the beginning, like probably 15 or more would show up on any given week. So that meant that even more were in the group because some could occasionally not make it. Right. Um, I think we had almost 30. Um of course, once we got closer, some people started making the wise decision to postpone because they weren't ready, and that was fine. Right. Um, so it got down to a core group. But, yeah, I mean, there's definitely – I think we ended up having a good balance of enough people that we got a lot of varying perspectives, but um, I think there ended up being two different groups, and that was good because then, you know, if there's 40 people on the call, not, it would be harder for everyone to participate. Right, right. And you're saying that uh, uh, people, like the rule was you're not supposed to look at the answers before jumping on this call so that everyone is truly blind right. about what the right answer is to, to facilitate right. discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the way I would do it is I would blind review it on my own mm -hmm. before showing up. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go ahead and talk through the, the difficult questions people had challenges with. Right. How, how long would the calls last? Um, a long time. And we ended up splitting. Sometimes we split into two different calls. Like one was an LR and one was an RC call. Yeah. Um, which might sound intimidating, but ultimately it really wasn't. I mean, it was up to you to join when you could. True. There was, if, if you had to leave, you had to leave it. Um, but I, I think overall, people really enjoyed it because you start to realize how many like great, smart people are around and you connect with them and you learn a lot from them. Yeah. It's more fun than blind reviewing by yourself. It's For like, sure. it's like, yeah. And it's, I think, I think it really helps to, uh, uh, to, to give perspective on how long blind reviewing just really takes. It's supposed to take a long time. Lisa, are you, are you here? Is your mic working? Yes, I'm here. Hi Lisa. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, you had asked some questions. So would you mind uh, asking Riley? I was curious how long you take to finish the LR section comfortably um, and like how many minutes do you have usually have at the end to check over your questions and do you usually feel that like oh I think I got like a hundred percent on this section or do you know like I definitely got like number whatever wrong like I don't have a good feeling about it. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So again it definitely evolved throughout um, the process. So. Yeah, I would say initially I was probably getting, you know, five to seven wrong per section. And then that sort of narrowed down to anywhere between two and five. And then finally it dropped down to zero to two. And that I changed my approach throughout. So initially in that phase, in the very beginning phase, I was still very, very focused on LR question types. So, yeah, I think if you're scoring in the 160s, you still have the capability to learn to like think about the fundamentals and to really orient yourself to what particular question types are asking and to try to master those question types. And then from there, you can start thinking more about um, execution and that sort of thing. And so about midway through my prep, I was finishing LR sections with maybe two to five minutes remaining, depending on you know, the difficulty of that particular LR section. And then I'd maybe get to quickly look over, you know, two to three questions at the most. Um, and as I got closer and closer to test day, I really changed my mindset. And I think a lot of that was from help from other sages like Josh. And also there's a really great webinar on skipping that everyone should go watch that JY did a while ago. And I think, yeah, people who are scoring in the 160s and lower 170s are probably committing, um, well, more more in the 160s are maybe occasionally committing overconfidence errors where they don't necessarily 
know the right answer, but you know, because of time constraints, they choose it and move on. But then once you get up more towards the 170s, you start having underconfidence errors. So basically on the questions that are easier, you're spending too much time on them. So that I really tried to develop this sense of like, okay, you've done hundreds of these LR questions before, you know that this answer is wrong because of this reason. So eliminate it and move on. And that's where I sort of developed that aggression and speed mantra going into LR. And that really changed the way I, I did LR. And I started finishing with eight, 10, sometimes 12 plus minutes at the end of a section where I was just really ripping through it. And um, I felt that that ultimately paid off. I mean, from a quantitative standpoint, my I, I kept, kept a rolling average of how many I was getting wrong. And, and I definitely picked up at least a point and a half at the end there by switching strategies. Um, because basically I thought, okay, you know, every couple tests, I'm probably gonna have an overconfidence error, but the one point I lose because I was overconfident on this one question will more than pay for itself when I have 10 minutes at the end of the section to go back to three hard questions and make sure I get all three of those right. That ultimately ended up being my strategy for LR was to become hyper aggressive. And I think when I first started out on my prep, I was, really convinced that I had to read every answer choice no matter what. And I do think that that probably is beneficial and the right way to go when you're in the 150s and 160s and maybe even the lower 170s. But I think after having done hundreds and hundreds of questions and starting to consistently score above a 175, it, it began to pay off to, uh, to skip answer choices on the easiest of the questions because that's basically time you're banking that you can invest later on. And now to be fair on the real thing in September, I got a main point question wrong and I can't wait to see how that comes out on seven stage analytics. I bet it's like a one or two star question. And so like, Hey, on the real thing, my gamble, like it got real. <laughs> I yeah. got a question wrong in, I looked on the analytics afterwards and I had gotten one other main point question wrong in all you know, 35 of my PTs. Yeah. And uh, so if I hadn't have done that, I would have had a 179, but I don't think I would do it again. I don't think I would do anything differently again. And that's because right. who's to say that if I hadn't have blasted through the beginning of that section that I wouldn't have, you know, I had that time to devote to the harder questions. Yeah. yeah. Did so, you get the easy MP question wrong because you didn't, you skipped on the, the answer choices? Um, I actually did not skip the answer choices on that one. Um, it, was, it, was, it, it is what it is, and I, I happened to miss that question. But again, I think ultimately I do remember being super nervous sitting, because that was the first section, sitting down and just being extraordinarily nervous. And um, then magically I finished the first 12 questions of that section in about seven and a half or eight minutes. Right. And so, I think even though I got a question wrong, I think it was question 10 maybe, or I don't even remember, it might've been somewhere around those first 12 questions. It was, it was in there and I got that one wrong. I really think it ultimately still pays off. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think the takeaway everyone is that it's worth it. Like, like these occasional overconfidence errors like Riley just talked about, it's, it's worth it um, because you end up just getting more time you can spend it on other questions. Okay, so thank you, Lisa. Uh, next, we have uh, Megan, who's got a question for you, Riley. Megan, is your mic working? Hi, yeah. Um, congratulations on your score, Riley, and thank you both so thank much you. for your time. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, because I noticed uh, that you answered a question on the forums about handling overconfidence errors. Um, and I wanted to ask what your thought process was like or what your approach was like when you need to eliminate all five answer choices because I'm really struggling um, to eliminate that really bad final answer choice. Um, and I know um, that it would probably be the best way to eliminate all five and then like sort of go back to the stimulus and go through the answer choices again. But it's really hard for me. I just wanted to ask um, what your experience was like. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think you're on the right track. Um, and it's definitely hard to do, but I think Eliminating all five answer choices is way better than choosing one and feeling really mixed on it. Because if you eliminate all five, you're already being like, huh, 
there's got to be something about this that I'm not getting. And a lot of the times that I ended up getting a question wrong, especially on LR, it was like, I didn't understand something about the stimulus. So I ended up eliminating the correct answer choice and then picking something else and being like, that's a really weird right answer, but you know, I eliminated everything else, so I'll go with it. And so I think that having the mindset of through your first sweep, just trying to eliminate answers is probably the best way to go. So rather than being like, I'm looking for the right answer, instead, you're like, I'm looking to eliminate all the wrong answers. And now there's exceptions for that, you know, if you really, if it's just a super easy question or you just get that question, then fine. There's, there's, there are times where you'll know the right answer and you'll go looking for it. But if you go through a stimulus and you're like, mm, not sure, then definitely first sweep, look to eliminate answers before confirming a right one. And then, yeah, I would say it's like really about developing sort of a spidey sense of really thinking about, you know, this is an unusual right answer, or there's just something about this answer that I, it just sounds odd. And, and that's really where going faster or skipping generally, regardless of how fast you go, skipping is super helpful because as people will tell you and have, have said in previous webinars and advice, the second pass can be a totally new experience and you can see the question in a different light. So I would say in those instances, if you're down to two, I don't know, play, play with whether or not you, you circle one before moving on or if you just totally don't circle either and then come back. But regardless, yeah, skip it. And I think the thing is like people debate whether or not to put a hard time limit on how much to spend on a particular question or not. But I like to think of it more in terms of like problem solving processes. As long as you feel like you are doing the right kinds of things to move towards the right answer, like you're really actually thinking about how the argument is structured or you're really comparing an answer choice to the facts of the stimulus, something like that, then keep working on the question. But if you're just like sort of rerunning over thoughts you've already had in your head or you start being tempted to compare the answers against one another, then just skip and, and move on. But yeah, so overall my answer would basically be think about eliminating wrong answers before circling what you feel like is the right answer and um, skipping is your friend. Thank you, Riley. Next, uh, we have Debbie. Uh, yeah, so I had a question regarding skipping RC questions. Um, I, I was wondering what your thought, Riley, is on when to return to these questions, whether it's at the end of the passage or at the end of the section. Um, I know that I'm sometimes tempted to just revisit those questions I skip at the end of the passage just because I feel like I remember more, I'm more familiar with the details, maybe that would give me an itch. But at the same time, sometimes I want to, do, to come back at the end of the section because I feel like it would give me a fresh perspective, although I'm also afraid of me having to spend more time rereading parts of the passages that I might have forgotten. So I was just wondering what your approach would be on that. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the unsatisfying answer is maybe both, or maybe that is satisfying, but I would say both. And I definitely did both. I, I think like for me, the big thing on RC was to truly not get hung up on debating answers. Like, no matter what, you just can't spend very much time on any one RC question. And that's something that I definitely struggled with more than LR, but I think you gotta be able to answer RC questions fast and that's not because you're suddenly magically better at them, it's just like you kinda have to just tell yourself like, I'm not gonna just spend two minutes on this one question because it's not worth it. Um, so I would say, yeah, first pass definitely at the end of each section, you know, like you get to the end. Of, so, so skip immediately. If it's a hard question, skip immediately and keep going because sometimes doing the other questions in the passage will kind of help your mind work, work through like what the passage is really all about. And then that can help you with the hardest question of the passage. So skip, come back at the end of the passage when the whole thing is still still sort of fresh in your mind. But I think like the danger on that is you can't get in this mindset of like, oh man, if I go into the next passage and then I'm gonna forget everything about this one. So I have to, I have to answer every question. And then suddenly you've spent 
you know, 11 minutes on a single passage because you just can't move on from it. Um, I ended up going minus zero on the actual um, RC for the September LSAT. And a lot of people thought that it was pretty hard. Um, but even then, I went back at the end. I remember finishing the entire thing with about four minutes left, maybe. And I remember going back to the second passage and then the third passage. And I think just like LR, your brain has a way of holding in the information and, and subconsciously processing. So you can still um, definitely make important insights and, and approach the passage with new perspective. So yeah, I would say skip, don't, don't spend too much time on any question, skip the hardest ones, come back at the end of the passage. But if you still can't get it very quickly, then move on to the next passage and come back at the end of the entire section. Thanks, Riley. Uh, Debbie, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that does. Thank you, Riley. Sure. Okay, uh, next, I'm turning this over to Serena. Serena had a question from earlier. Serena, is your mic working? Yes, is, is it working? Yes, hi. Okay, perfect, hi, hi, Riley, hi, JY. Um, hey. I'm actually gonna piggyback off, a little bit off of um, Debbie and Megan in terms of RC, uh, just because it's so much fun. Um, for RC questions, do you feel like, because it's not as methodical as like LR and like LG, is there a general theme with um, the reading comp questions? Is repetition going to help there as well in terms of yeah. anticipating? Um, and then I guess my second question is, I guess you can ask them at the same time, is for test day, like the night before or Go, walking into the LSAT, did you feel 100% prepared? Because I, I know that I've never felt that way about any test that I've walked into. Uh -huh. So um, just wanted to see what your personal experience was with that. Yeah, RC. Well, one, one thought that I had when I was answering Debbie's question and that um, I want to say before I forget is that I think maybe rereading isn't so bad. Like. I think a lot of people are afraid to reread the passage because they think it's going to suck up time and you're going to have to just play with this concept yourself and figure it out. But to me, I felt like, hey, I actually could like really briefly skim and reread significant portions of the passage like pretty fast. And because I'd already read it once, I could absorb that information better. So play with this and figure out if it's true for you or not. But that really helps to alleviate some things, like it, especially in the beginning of my RC prep, I was consistently missing stated in the passage type uh, questions because I didn't retain that information and I was too afraid to go look for it because I thought it was going to suck up all the time. So I basically ended up guessing a lot and I realized, hey, you know what, actually, like once you've read it in detail on the first pass and then you start answering questions, you can go back and re-skim pretty quick and still have a return on investment. But to answer the rest of your question on RC, I actually think that repetition is hugely important. Um, about halfway through my prep, I started realizing that more and started doing like a sort of a form of foolproofing on RC, which I really think did help. So what I did was I'd read a passage and I had a Word document where I would type out a one, one sentence summary of each paragraph, then I'd write down the main point, the purpose, the tone, viewpoints, and structure. And I mean, each of those would end up being like between a third of a page to an entire page, single spaced. Um, and yeah, I would just do that for, you know, I try to do a passage a day, maybe, or sometimes if I was ambitious more. Um, but I think in that sense, it was sort of a foolproofing in the same way that like, you're training your LG mind to automatically make inferences, you're training your RC mind to like, see the underlying purpose to see the how the viewpoints conflict or agree with one another. So I would definitely say uh, do that. I think that was good. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, to, to add on to that, I really like that. It's it's very uh, RC, I guess it's more opaque, um, whereas compared to LG, I think it's more transparent, where you, you just you see that they're just kind of testing for the same thing every single time. Like it's very transparent how similar logic games are to each other. But I think RC is also similarly uh, similar to, to each other. They're kind of always asking for, like Riley, you were saying, like, what would you write down for each each passage? Yeah, so I did. 
one a paragraph summary main point usually just a line purpose yeah and that could be just a couple of words about like you know advocating for a new approach to research or debunking a myth or something like that yeah so like always they'll ask the main point right um the purpose right. you can anticipate they're going to ask for that um, just getting uh, very short summaries of each paragraph is going to help you see the structure, how the paragraphs run into each other, how they connect into each other, right? Um, like author's tone, again, it's it's highly repetitive from passage to passage, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing one other quick question here before I'll answer how I felt on test day. Um, where was it? I think it was just from Jennifer about um running out of time and not reading a passage um i mean i think fundamentally you've got to just keep practicing rfc and get to the point where you can hopefully do all of them but um my thought on both lg and rc is to attempt every passage or game because i think that there are easy questions in every passage and game and there are hard questions in every passage and game so I think it's better to do every game and do all the easy questions or just skip the hard questions than it is to like try to get the hardest questions for one passage and then not even see the other passage. So that would be my short answer on that. Um, how I felt on test day. Um, you know, good question. Nervous. I felt I definitely scouted out this the um, test center. I had obviously taken all the proctors, so I knew all the instructions. Um, I did, you know, everyone on seven stage is a huge advocate for mindfulness and meditation. And I 100% agree with that. I did that. And I think we should do that regardless of the LSAT. It just helps your everything. Um, but no, I definitely felt very nervous. I mean, I walked in there and, uh, I had brought a warm up. I brought a warm up, and I intentionally got the easy questions to do a warm up for, and I tried to sit down and do the warm up, and I just picked like the wrongest of the wrong answers on, on the easiest of the questions. And I was like, oh man, wow, this that's not a good sign. I'm not even going to do the rest of this warm up. <laughs> so, like, you know, even having done 35 plus practice tests, like, you're going to be nervous, and that's okay. And um, I guess when the first section was called, it was almost just like, I mean, this was the real thing. What was I going to do? I was, I, there, there was nothing left for me to do, but start answering the questions I, rather than uh, my biggest concern going in to the test was that I was going to be like doing a meta evaluation of my performance. Cause on practice tests, I definitely did that throughout. I was like, okay, I'm probably minus this at this point through the exam. I'm probably minus this through this section, but on the actual test day, it was just like, well, I'm just going to go. And trust that all the work I've done is there and luckily um that immediately paid off like I said I finished the first 12 questions in like eight minutes and so that sort of put it all to rest I, I truly feel bad for the people who um had the experimental RC to start because that was apparently like one of the hardest sections of all time and then so sucks for them because <laughs> I'm sure that devastated plenty of people. I would be genuinely curious to know if there was like a statistically different score between those people and the other people. But um, yeah, I mean, nerves are going to be a factor for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. We have Mitzi. Did you want to ask a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Uh, so just going back quickly to RC, um, I haven't spent too much time there, but you did mention um, that you were like notating a passage per day. And I'm sure you were doing that for a while. So just after doing that for some time, like as you're speed reading under time conditions, like were you able to just naturally pull those things because you had been doing it for, you know, quite some time or like how did it how did that pay off as you're timing yourself? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it is kind of similar to LG. It's like just all of a sudden, you know, and then you start seeing LG rules just automatically have certain um, inferences depending on the game board setup. It sort of was like that in RC, just automatically, you know, if every time I did an RC passage untimed in my little practice, I knew, hey, you know, 
in four minutes after I'm done reading this passage, I'm going to have to go write down the purpose. So of course I'm looking for that purpose right now as I go read through it. And that eventually translates to the actual time to practice. It's like, you just naturally start reading for purpose. You naturally start looking for clues that give you the main point. You naturally start looking at the meta structure of the passage. Um, so I think having to be forced to explicitly write it out during your untimed repetition practices, it's with enough time, you're going to start looking at the RC passages in that way. Um, yeah, so I would do that. And I mean, you said speed reading, but definitely don't speed through the uh, through the RC reading. I, I put in at least three and a half, usually more like four minutes to reading each passage. Um, but yeah. And sorry, just one more question. Sure. How long did you do that? I mean, how long did it take you until you started seeing that payoff? Uh, a while, like, you know, at least three weeks, probably more like six weeks. I started off doing RC practice a lot less intentionally and just kind of doing the RC, reading a passage, doing the questions, BRing the questions and seeing where I was at. Um, and then I realized, you know, again, about halfway through my prep. So with a couple months remaining that I needed to be more intentional. And um, I would say it basically, it paid off in eliminating some variation. So I, I had the potential to do well on RC and I did score well early on in RC, but I would still have times where I would get, you know, double the amount wrong. And as I approached test day, I think implementing that strategy, it would consistently not miss more than two, oh, usually wow. only one. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Missy. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left, and if you guys have any questions, now would be the time to ask. I think I made it through the list. I might have skipped over some I see, people. I see one here from Ian. Oh, right. He says, did you start PTing immediately after finishing the core curriculum, or did you take some time to drill and foolproof first? Um, I guess it kind of depends on your own personal schedule, but like uh, Josh and um, David Counts Playable would tell you, don't burn through your practice tests if you don't have to. They're precious resources. There's only a couple of them. So um, I did start, I did one prep test basically right after I finished the core curriculum, but then I didn't do another one for like two weeks. Um, and during that time, I was doing drilling and I was doing foolproofing. Um, and then I kept, did another one and waited another two weeks and then slowly narrowed that down to 10 days and then like seven-ish. And then by the end, I was doing about two PTs, sometimes a little bit less every week. So yeah, don't, don't waste your PTs. If you're feeling underconfident about where your skills are at, you're always better off spending more time drilling and foolproofing before you start PTs. Because especially early on in the prep, PTs aren't really that important. Like, you know you need to learn more. You know there's plenty of points left on the table. So a PT is just going to tell you the obvious. And you've got, you're still, you still have so much to learn that like pinpointing a particular weakness isn't as high of a priority. So yeah, I would say, once you finish the core curriculum, loop back on the things you're struggling the most with, keep up with our um, LR and RC drilling and foolproofing, and then slowly wade your way into PTing. Nice. Uh, so we, we got three really good questions here. I guess oh, I'll just ask them in, in order. Al Alex is, uh, is wondering if there's anything you do different, if you could uh, go back and do it all over again. Great question. Um, I would do way more mindfulness. I would do way more meditation and more exercise for sure. You mean like Those physical huge. exercise? Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of people I think are resistant to try meditation because it sounds like, you know, it sounds like new agey, like pseudoscience mm -hmm. bullshit. Like, and it's really hard in the beginning too. <laughs> like like it's, it's actually really difficult. But um, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I also, I think meditation is great. I just, I... So I tell. I think once you stick, if you stick with it for like at least three weeks, you'll just start feeling like amazing afterwards. You'll just feel so much more relaxed, focused, yeah. and I think especially like with 
the way the internet works this day is we're all being trained to have like two second attention spans. Right. Um, yes. So more mindfulness, more exercise. And then I guess the other thing would be like even more intentionality in my practice. So even more deliberate in depth analysis of LR questions, even more in depth analysis of RC. I mean, quality over quantity for sure. The highest amount of high quality training is obviously the best, but just diving as deep as possible. Great. And uh, on the point about meditation, it's um, there's actually a lot of hard scientific evidence backing its effectiveness. Um, so it's yeah. not at all like pseudoscience. Um, yeah. So definitely, definitely uh, try that if you guys haven't, haven't done it. I just, I, I personally find it um, to be calming like you have this constant noise in your mind that you're not really even aware is there like that. A lot of that just kind of goes away. Okay. And then Jennifer is asking, since there's only a month left until the December test and uh, she's, she's thinking about how to best use that time to improve LG. Yeah. Um, LG is hard to give nuanced advice necessarily because it's a lot about the grind and about yeah. just, repeating games. I mean, I think repetition is important. Almost more than exposure to new games is exposure to old games to really ingrain how to do those. So do as much volume as you can without sacrificing quality. Um, I mean, focus on the ones you have trouble with. But the, I think the other thing too is like, a hard logic game is hard for everyone. You know, if you give me a hard logic game, it's still gonna take me 10 to 13 minutes to do it. The key is that I can do the easy logic games in three to six minutes so that I have the time. So, you know, I don't think the advice is like, just do the hardest games and then you'll get better at everything. It's like, you have to do each type of game on a repetitive level so that you can get really fast at the easy games and you can learn how to handle the hard games. But yeah, I guess for this last month, it's still just try to get that volume in as much yeah. as you can get volume in without sacrificing quality. Yeah. And uh, Jennifer, if you haven't ever taped yourself doing a logic game, you should do it. Tape yourself yeah. doing a game and watch how you do the game. Uh, you can compare it against a lot of the live commentary footage we have on Seven Sage. Um, yes. One thing I'll say, like I'm, I'm reviewing, uh, like I'm like sort of, I guess, always trying to put out more of these live commentary videos, but uh, this current footage I'm reviewing right now, like um, I notice that uh, most students just don't have a set, like a checklist. You know, I do this first, then I do that. And the, so they end up skipping these things that they're like, if they were calmer, they would know to do. Um, and, and as a result of skipping them, they just make these minor errors. So um, I guess, Jennifer, for, for you, I would say, like, make sure that when, when you start a brand new logic game, you are always like, you're always penciled down, reading the opening paragraph and looking at the rules real quick and even looking at the first question, especially if that first question is an acceptable situation question. Because those three pieces of information tend to reveal what the game board is going to be. Um, if you know the game board just from reading the first two lines, that's great, but still read the rest of the paragraph and the rules and the first acceptable situation question just to uh, confirm that, in fact, you have envisioned the right game board in mind. And then when you're going through the questions, uh, as soon as you read a rule, you want to go to that first acceptable situation question and use that rule to eliminate answer choice. And then return to the rule, to the next rule, and then you know eliminate the next answer choice, return to that rule, uh, the next rule, and then eliminate the next answer choice. Right. So that's the second step. And then the third step is, of course, just your standard game board setup. You turn all the rules into visual, into something visual, and then you set up the game board um, and then the next step uh, after that, when you hit in, when you hit the questions, is you want to make sure to always approach the uh, questions that give you additional restrictions, additional premises first, right? So the questions will be like, if M is in three, then which one of the following could be true? Like those kind of questions you want to do first before returning to the uh, the naked must be true, or the naked could be true, like you know, no additional. So if you follow that, and, and finally the last thing is when you're done with a game. Just reset, put your pencil down, uh, maybe take one deep breath to just reset before rushing into the next game, All right? So that's kind of what I mean by like a checklist so that there's this procedure, right, that you're, you're following. Yeah, and I would strongly reiterate the live commentary. Um, 
there's a woman that JY has a live commentary with on the earlier Logic games. I can't remember her name, but she's really good. And JY does a great job of breaking down what she's doing right. And I definitely remember earlier on in my prep seeing her do it and being like, wow, that's really good. And like kind of mimicking some of her stuff. Leah? Yeah, I think it is Leah. Yeah. 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 So that's, it's very important. You you won't know these things that you're doing or these things that you're not doing until you start watching yourself uh, either do or omit um, the, the best practices. Um, okay. So uh, lastly, Lisa, uh, you're asking if uh, Riley ever got stuck in the high 160s and low 170s. And if, if so, how can, how, how did you break through that plateau? That's a good question. That's that's a tough place to get stuck at, and I think a lot of like really high uh, potential seven stagers do end up getting stuck in that like one sixty eight, one sixty nine range, or sometimes break into one seventy, but uh, they can't consistently do it. I think like it, where's your BR score? Because for me, that's always like the first thing. If you can push your BR score up a few points, then your time score is probably going up with it. So focus as much as you can on the BR. I don't know if there really is a magic bullet. I think once you start getting into that range, you do want to start thinking about execution. So like doing a confidence drill, your BR is always between 177 and 179. See, that's pretty great. So from there, I would say, yeah, you, you need to start thinking about some execution strategy so do a confidence drill that's where you like try to do a section of lr as as fast and recklessly as you possibly can to see whether or not you're being underconfident in your sections really think about executing a section as fast as you can without sacrificing accuracy and then going back i mean i sort of i think filming like jay already said filming is a big part of um how you do a section filming was was helpful to me because it really helps to get your internal clock set up so that you're not burning too much time into any one question. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's just really hard. <laughs> it is really hard. It's and Lisa, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if this applies to you, but this is just a, uh, a generic answer to a lot of students who I've seen struggle in that range. It's, you know, it's not like they can't answer the harder questions and not like they don't get the logic of certain curve breaker questions or whatever that those, you know, and your blind review score testifies to that. Um, you, you just, you, you blind review close to 180, right? So the issue is just with how you apportion your time. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's um, you know, these students are spending way too much time on these easy one star, two star questions. Right, and there's no need to. It's not like if they if they like cut the time, let's say they spend 60 seconds on average on one star questions. If they cut that time by, you know, one third, right, and spend 40 seconds, it's not like their their uh, what do you call it? It's not like their accuracy would drop by very much at all, um, right? So, but but then what you do gain on the other hand is a bunch of time. And that's the time that you need to do the harder questions. So I, I've just found, again, I don't know if this applies to you, but but just that sort of a generic answer that I know applies to some people is is uh, is just reapportioning the time that you're spending. So this goes back to what Riley said earlier about being underconfident, uh, underconfidence being an issue, you know, for sort of high scoring people, right? Like you should have moved on already from these easier questions. Um, I don't know. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you so much, both of you. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, if people are asking about the recording. Yeah. Just you know, with your iPhone, like m mostly your your smartphones now have cameras that can record at very high high pixel rate. So you typically want to do like 1080p or 4K uh, because the <laughs> the text is quite small. So if you if you record at any lower resolution, it's going to be very difficult to see when you when you look at the footage. Okay, so we've we've come to the end of uh, this AMA. Everyone, thank you so much for being here, uh, and Riley, especially, thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Um, to make sure people can still reach you after this AMA, yeah, would you mind sharing how they could do that if they want to continue the conversation? Yeah, um, I would say just feel free to message me on 7Sage 
Um, you can see my, like, you're here. So you obviously know my seven city username is all ALA21. Um, I've definitely talked to JY and, and Josh about holding office hours and things like that. So feel free to send me a message or start up a thread on just the regular form and I and other people can help out. And then hopefully I'll be around on some office hours and some of the other um, weekly workshop type things too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Riley. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Have All a right, good night. Take care. Bye-bye.